Dan, what's up? How's it going? Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined today by the one, the only, Mr. At 51VB, Daniel Manili. Dan is joining us all the way from Luxembourg, although he's, as you can tell by his jersey at the moment, and the Raptors banner in the background, he is Canadian, he's from Toronto, um, but yeah, he's just working over on the European side of things. Dan, how's it going? It's been, it's been a while. Glad to have you Everett, on. It's, Everett, it's been too long. I'm really happy to be back. We're talking volleyball because... I mean, we've we've gone way back doing uh, these podcasts together, so it's finally. I don't know if we've done one uh, done one in a while. So no, glad it's to be back it's on. been a while. I don't think we've done one since like right before you left for Luxembourg. And and I want to say that that's my most downloaded episode by like a good margin. So. Really? That's surprising. Yeah, that's that's surprising. But come on, Everett. Oh, don't sell uh, yourself short. I mean, don't yourself sell yourself short, man. You've been you've been killing it with the content. Uh, I haven't gotten to it today, but actually, you just released another uh, podcast with. Uh, I mean, it, it's weird because I t- almost talk to you every single day, but we just haven't seen each other even over a Zoom call in in over a year because of of the Discord channel. But uh, you and another member of our Discord channel, Rob St. Clair, uh, have been doing some shows for the CEV as well. So I th- I need to listen to that show right after I listen. I record this one with you. Yeah, the European Volleyball Show, quick plug, we just uh, started it at the CV, so every Friday, 5 p.m. CET, 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, I guess. Yeah, that works. Yeah, we're gonna, me, and Rob, me and Rob St. Clair, just talk real casual show, YouTube on the CV, European Volleyball Channel, just talk volleyball, talk a lot of Champions League in the last couple episodes, so definitely check that out. Um, if, if you're a fan of this, I'm, I'm sure you'll be a fan of, of, of that as well. Yeah, and then also, as, as I mentioned, um, Dan runs the popular 51VB channel, both on Instagram and on YouTube. Some of his YouTube videos are, to be honest, his YouTube videos are up there, the, the highest quality produced videos in all of volleyball YouTube. So um, you, if, if you want to go it's see... It's low bar. I, I mean, it is the low bar, but you're still at the top of that that mountain, okay? A hill. Thank you. Hill. Thank you, though. Thank it's, you. It's, it's you and the McKibbins, and then, man, that one that um, Out of System just put out recently, uh, oh, too. Sure. I feel like I feel like Gage has just been like upping his editing game, like video by video. It's been a lot of fun. Was to that see. Gage or was that Joe? Who, who did the editing on that? Because like, as you probably could see, but as you know, someone who edits a lot of video, like the editing of that must have taken like was was fantastic. Yeah, hundred hours probably. I, I'm <laughs> I'm crazy. not I'm not entirely not sure to be that. to be honest. I, I I've I've indirectly spoken to them once because they were on the uh, USA team for Norseka Championships in Winnipeg. And uh, they were talking to Jared Brown, who was doing the commentary for that that event at, at, at the end of it all. And I was there, you know, just kind of a bystander. But right. I've I've ac- I've actually never met them, so it, it'd be interesting to 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 figure out um, which one does uh, does the editing because I'm pretty sure, like the McKibben brothers, I'm pretty sure it's Riley McKibben that does the majority of okay. of, of the editing. Um, they they're they're so lucky. For those, yeah, I was gonna say for those of you who who don't listen to these. Uh, have a list to a podcast between me and ever before there's going to be a lot of uh of tangents here so yeah well i mean that's the so point that, that's the point of a podcast though you know it's a, it's a little bit longer you can go a little bit more in depth you can go on maybe a few tangents let the audience learn a little bit about it but uh but yeah just to, just to say all of those those other guys aren't like you know you and i where we have to they've, they've got someone else to rely on you and i just kind of do everything on our own but that being said we're gonna just <laughs> jump right into it uh today we're gonna talk about a little bit of champions league um a little bit of uh italian super Liga, the champions league we are about to jump into the big biggest week of the champions league or the men's champions league we just had the biggest week of the women's champions league go down this past week uh actually a couple of shout outs uh alexa gray and her team busar Asizio moving on and then kira van reich 36 points yesterday Massive she had a performance really nice for her game yesterday. Yeah, Un- unfortunately, the team not wasn't in a position to advance, but but she was a monster yesterday for sure. Yeah. So that is the end of the fourth round, the group stage of the women's Champions League. Is it, Champions League is that correct, or is there still well, no? Yeah, that's it's it. Done. We have our eight teams. We're gonna draw them next Friday. The drawing of lots on the CV European Volleyball YouTube channel. So exciting right. stuff well, we're done and then we got the exact same thing with the men next week with uh 24 24 games in three days so 
Yeah, it is a lot, a lot going on. I think one of the first things that I'd like to talk about in terms of the 24 games in in the next, in three days going down Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, I'm not entirely sure what days of the week that is, um, but talking about, first of all, the situation surrounding Jeff W. Weigel, I don't know if I pronounced that right. I just kind of mumble that one out and hope that <laughs> Polish tough. people... The Polish teams are tough. Yeah, sometimes, and hope that Polish people don't get too mad at me. I don't know, so I apologize. Um, but... Um, JW, as we can refer to them, will not be heading to Zenit Kazan this week um, as a mandate by the CEV. And my biggest question is because of that. Can, can I do? Can I do a quick uh, corporate correction there? Oh, okay, absolutely. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. So it, it wasn't the CEV. It was uh, Yastrzemski who who pulled out. Oh, okay. Because I mean, it's the same. Same doesn't really matter. But same, same. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they they had the the cases, and they would only have I think seven or eight players that were available to play. So. T- tough situation all around. I really would have liked to see them there. Yeah, absolutely. I I definitely agree. But my biggest question is how do because of the way the Champions League is, it works, and you have five pools and eight teams moving on. There's three of the second place teams. So are we just deciding that that pool, the second place team, is going to get an advance because they've automatically got six you know set wins and they're two full wins on their bet so six set wins and then that ratio because the the big divider uh, tiebreaker is always the points for and against right how do you do how do you calculate that ratio when they've won six sets 25-0 giving them you know an advantage of 150 points to, to nothing over the teams in other pools yeah it's an advantage for sure um just the way the way it ended up happening uh, all, on the women's side, it worked out fine, where we had all the teams able to participate. And honestly, only having two game, two two teams not being able to to participate was actually, I, I thought was a, was a pretty big success. It easily could have been uh, many more teams that couldn't couldn't have flown teams. I mean, we're talking about a tournament that's going all across the continent, tons of different countries involved. Um, I think the tournament format was a, a really good idea that allowed a lot of these games to happen. But is it completely fair the way that the points is probably not. So they're, they're, there's the 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 uh, SCEV isn't going to try to do to anything to rectify that. They're just going to let it happen. Yes. I, I mean, at a certain point, I, I like what can you do? You know, I it's it's tough, but I, I guess it's just the reality the reality of it all. Um, we're gonna let's let's just hop over here and um, Dan, you won't be able to see this on your screen, but we've got the different uh, pools set up here for the men's side of the CEV and we're just going to kind of go go through them uh, one by one the first pool uh, never mind first pool is pool A and that one is already done Zaxa taking that one easily pretty much six wins in a row uh, only dropping three sets in the uh, throughout the entire time we did see uh, both Graham Vigras and Nick Hogue compete in this one down here with Fenerbahce uh, unfortunately with a two and four record losing to both of the Polish clubs I mean, but that's there's there's a couple interesting stories here because we're we're a little biased as you can see by my jersey, but and Fenerbahce was the best team by a pretty good margin as you've talked about I think before on a couple of your shows in Turkey, mm-hmm. and I did not expect them to maybe I wouldn't say roll over, but but not perform I guess up to their standards, especially against Skra, who's struggling a little bit in the Plus League. That those games were a lot less close than I that I was expecting before before this all went down yeah i kind of i was very interested by this pool mainly because of fenerbahce's position in it lindemann's alst i mean you're taking the 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 spot of a very like a stalwart cev champions league team in in masik and you know they did a not bad job they did they pushed one of the the, the matches to, to five i can't really remember which one um i think it was against scrub but <laughs> um but uh but yeah, I mean, I was expecting Fenerbahce to come out with a, a better a better result because they they, they are pretty follow, mm-hmm. they are pretty solid all around. They got Hidalgo, they've got Nick Hogue, Grant, Grant Biagas, as as we mentioned, and they've really been, just been the cream of the crop of the Turkish Liga so far. So it was it was surprising to see them come into Champions League and struggle a little bit, a little bit like um, uh, Re- Re- Rejov, uh Kiravan Reich's team, who's at the top yes. of the Torn Liga, and the, and yeah. they didn't manage to move on in Champions League either. I, I, li- I like the Turkish Liga. Uh, <laughs> man, the, I'll use that one. <laughs> it, I think it's I think it's actually the Efferler League. 
Yeah, I think it's something like that. The Afrolur League. In the Sultan League, I think, for the women. Yes. But yeah, F Fenerbahce, especially in that in that first tournament where we weren't sure if like Taylor Sander was going to play. Um, yeah. I, I think I actually think they played a lot better in the second tournament. I think that first tournament, I don't know if they got caught off guard, something to do with travel, just had an off week. But unfortunately, um, but but actually, this we were looking at some of the results, and this is actually better than a lot of the old Fenerbahce teams have done. There, there's been a couple 0 and sixes in the last few years for Fenerbahce, so not yeah. not a complete loss for them. It's it's we're no longer in the time of, of like the the 2010 to 2015s where some of the, the Turkish teams were, especially on the men's side, were some of the strongest teams in Champions League and you were seeing teams push for, you know, Champions League titles. And that's just that's just not the case right now with, with Turkish volleyball. But I do think it's a little better than 2016 to 2019, 20, where you had mostly Turkish guys and maybe one, sometimes two, uh, two foreigners. Fair enough. All right, well, move it, moving on here to Pool B. Um, this one is a fun one for everyone. Chibit Luigi Itanova, Perugia, Tours VB, uh, Arcus Izmir. Is Arcus, are we going to be able to see Glenn Hogue, Jay Blankano, and Co. competing this week? Nope. No. Nope. They uh, also, no, they, they're not playing as well. Ah, that sucks. I mean, it, it's, it's tough because, because, because they didn't play in the first tournament, it's a little tougher to justify um, playing in the second one because realistically, you don't have any shot. Of qualifying so but yeah I, I really wanted to see this team too in the preseason so I, i'm pretty i i, I, I would have liked to see them in champions league because i think that i think it would have done all right yeah i i think so too they've been having a bit of an up and down league in the effort effort of the league but they're still uh, up near at the top of the table they were at the very top of the table for uh, a little bit then before venerbahce came in and and took them over but unfortunate we're not going to be able to see jay blanks until uh in until the the springtime with Team Canada, unless you catch him on an further league stream, which I can, it's, it's it it seems like it's the league that has some of the most options for streaming, but I can't. It's hard to follow the further league sometimes. It's all over the place. Yeah, for sure. It's a uh, it's you know it's 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 available when it's there, but sometimes not every game that you want to watch is broadcast. And then if if you're you know it's like oh okay these two teams are playing at, at 7 p.m tonight and then you prepare for it and then you go on and there's no stream then that's it, you really need to be consistent if you're if you're showcasing a league like this yeah i've i've woken up earlier to watch arcus a few times to ha it, only to have no stream so that that's always been fun too yeah but especially in that case it's frustrating the, one thing I, I would like to point out here is that the fact that arcus won't be there you have two teams moving forward i mean let's be honest here and this pool kind of works out perfectly because, you know, we know the two teams are going to be moving forward. And let's be honest, this could very well be the Champions League final at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Lube Perugia, I always said this earlier on the, the European Volleyball Show, but it's probably the two best teams, in my opinion, in volleyball right now. As we saw with playing the last two times already in the last two weeks in the Italian Cup Finals, and then also a great five-set regular season game last week. Yeah, uh, Perugia got another one on the board last week. Was is that correct? I yeah. actually I actually missed that yeah. that game. Yeah, Perugia Perugia won that one in five in that Lube won Italian Cup Finals in four. Yeah, so I mean, if we're going by it, I think it's Perugia's turn to to get another one, even up the season series at three and three apiece before heading into um heading into uh, the playoffs. Because then at that point, each of them would have a regular season win. Each of them would have a cup win with the Supercopa and the Italian Cup. And then each of them would have a Champions League win too. And I think that would just set the, the scene for the Italian League finals very, very, very well. But that obviously, is is that going to be another match of the week this week with uh, Civitinova and Perugia? I know we're showing it on YouTube. So definitely, uh, if you no matter where you are, you can just watch it on YouTube. So that's, that'll be... That's that's key. Make sure you guys you guys uh, check that one out. Uh, one thing to note: Tools VB just actually had a pickup recently, picking up uh, Australian libero Luke Perry. Yeah, I mean, Tours they they've won. They I feel like they dominate the French league every, every season. And the fact that Montpellier, their Canadian guys are 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 winning in first place in the French league, they needed a little bit of reinforcement. And you know, you could do a lot worse than Luke Perry in terms of a mid season. Pick up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, bit, I, you know, it's uh, a, not really going to boost them that much here in the Champions League as, you know, 
I think if they can pull out a win, if pulling out a win would be miraculous. But at the end of the day, even if they did pull out a win, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be moving on. So uh, really focusing on the French league is tools w- with that pickup. Moving on now to Pool C. Um, this is the other pool that we discussed a little bit earlier: Zenit Kazan, Berlin, um, ACH Ljubljana, and Sergi Weigel. Um, Berlin not having not the strongest version of Berlin we ever see, but it looks like they're going to get uh, get the pass there and move on to the quarterfinals. Yeah, I mean, they definitely benefited, definitely benefited from uh, Yastrzemski not playing because that's a team that can I would for sure favor over Berlin in in the two game series. And yeah, Berlin. I mean, they have some good names on their roster, but I, I don't. Yeah, I guess it just hasn't really come together this season. I think you actually watch more German league than I do, at least this season. But, you know, Ben Patch had, had a couple injuries here or there. And it looks like on paper, Sergey Grankin with Kevin LaRue and, and uh, Ader Carbonera, that's like a really good combination. But maybe all three guys are, are a couple years past their primes. Well, I, I think we've seen some inju- injuries to, to Grankin. And I think Pierre Puyol, the French setter, is, is also one of the backups there. And I think he's even, even he sees some injury, maybe some coronavirus. I, uh, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe we can. We should check in with Cobalt on the Discord chat, and and he yeah, exactly. and, and he, you know he's he always seems to know. But uh, yeah, you're right. They've kind of struggled, and they just don't have the firepower that they've had, especially on the left side. Yeah, they've got Ben Patch, but who is it? Is it Cody Kessel? And um, why am I blanking? T- Timothy Carley has has been a lot of time on yeah. the left side, but it's been a bit of a it's been a bit of a rotating cast through Berlin. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be an interesting matchup between Ljubljana and and Berlin. I don't really think Ljubljana has anything to bring to bring to the table uh, against them, but it should be interesting. Maybe knowing that Jesperi Weigel isn't there, and if they push forward and 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 beat Berlin somehow, they could they could uh, qualify ahead of them. Yeah, I mean, always got to watch out for bows that are Vucevic. Vucevic. <laughs> Which, some of those Serbian names. But my point is, I remember every you, we were there together in 2019 Nations League watching the Serbian, what, the C team? B, C team play? B team, B team. And I remember B team, yeah, B, yeah, was B team. But we saw their, their opposite there, just absolutely bombing balls. And Bozidar, I mean, I think he's the third best Serbian opposite right now. Hot take on the podcast. I thought I thought the opposite we watched with uh, for Serbia was Petkovic that time. It might have been a bit of both. It might have been a bit of both. I th- Petkovic, I think he's better than Pe- Petkovic. Really? Okay. Yeah. Pe- Petkovic, I, I, I think it's been the weakest link on Scraw this year. I mean, I tend to agree. Yeah, I said that in some of my preview podcasts that they they should Scraw's a team that can find a better opposite, in my opinion, than do some Petkovic. I I I definitely agree. I mean, I think I think why I remember him is that he, I think he was the 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 opposite that went off for um, Serbia the night that they beat Canada in in Nations League. Where we were there, but okay. I I do remember talking to him with him after the bar and him telling me he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to play for Scraw next year, and I was just kind of like, oh, you're going to all right, like sure, oh, all right, but but yeah, I, I, I to be honest, I haven't in years past when you know Glenn Hogue was running Ljubljana. Or I guess back then it was Bled. Uh, I watched quite a bit of them. A few years ago when my boy Jory Mantha was playing for them, I, I watched them. But I haven't really watched much Ljubljana recently. And, I mean, I don't think they've really given me um, much reason, reason to either, especially in this in this pool. It's a, it's, it's a bit of a tough one. Yeah, for sure. And I think I earlier I picked Berlin to go through to the quarterfinals just because of those two 3-0 wins do help a lot. So, yeah. I, and I, I think they can beat Ljubljana. And honestly, I think maybe Berlin, given the way Zenit Kazan is playing, could even you know take them to five sets. Really? Ooh, okay, that's a hot take. That 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 game is going to be going down. Well, it's clearly not happening on the. Oh wait, yeah, actually, it has. It probably is happening on the tenth. What what day is that? Will that be? Uh, that will be Tuesday. Tenth is the Wednesday. Yeah, the Wednesday. So t- Wednesday will be the, the the big matchup between Zenit Kazan and the Berlin recycling body bodies. So that's gonna be a fun one. Do you you, you honestly think Berlin has a has a chance to 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 steal yeah. one from Kazan here? 
I mean, because on well, Duke, I, I said I said two sets, still a, a ranking point, maybe not a win, um, but okay. I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down here. I I I, I see what you mean. Because on did did get a good win this week uh, over Kuzbas. Uh, I'd have to double check. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, yeah. It, but I, I do know. Yeah, I do know they beat someone. They're slightly riding the ship a little bit. Yeah, they're they're back. They're back in the win column. But uh, all right, well, moving on now to Pool D. Pool D honestly might be one of the the most interesting pools because if you had told me that Kuzbas would be one and two heading into this second tournament, I would have told you you were crazy, especially given. The fact that both Modena and Warsaw's roster from last year to this year have taken significant hits. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, Kemerovo too in the Russian league is pl is playing quite well, and I still, I still, I mean, Modena is up three zero, which for sure helps. But I still think this this pool could end up with all with any of the top three teams potentially qualifying. I mean, Kemerovo we saw it with with Booster Arzizio on the women's side that you know came up. One it started one and two in the first tournament, and then came in and got that four four and two uh, qualification. So it, c it can't happen. Yeah, I mean, I, is it out of this realm for Kamarovo for Kuzbas to sweep the pool, sweep the next three out three matches? Absolutely not. Um, and I mean, I'm sure that they'd be going into this this week, go you know, uh, opting to do just that. Where is that one going down? Where where is that tournament being played? This tournament is being played. Ooh, that's a good question. Not in Kemerovo. No. Not in Versava. I want to say it's Modena. I think it's it's happening in Modena. Yeah. Okay. Good. So they're going to be everyone's going to be loading up on Tortellini. Um so it should we should be a fun one. <laughs> should be a fun one. But can Modena like they picked up Paul Buchkeger? Do Buchkeger? I say Buchkeger. Buchkeger? Um the Australian it's more uh, fun to say. Yeah. The Australian uh, Austrian opposite. Since then, do you think that's enough to put them above? Because I feel like Modena, all they need to do is win w one match. No, they they yeah. need, they need to win two. If they pick up two wins, they they guarantee themselves moving forward. Um, I think if they won two and lost to Versava and Versava, and they, they could still go in second place. But again, with with five wins, you're you're almost guaranteed to go through with the one of the second second place ones as well fair enough Mod modena this year it almost is like it's modena's this beautiful boat that just doesn't have a fast enough engine you know you've got yeah. you've got all of these nice pieces and you've got you know the first two touches of the ball with grabenikov and michael christensen is only you know rivaled by zaxa with zatorski and, and Tonioti. But then after that, when you go down through the rest of the roster, they just they're just not quite enough to compete with with the with the big dogs this year. Yeah, but I think I think the, and they played well in Champions League. But I think the reason is you see, like they're they're good for Champions League, but the Italian league is just so competitive. I mean, it's like think about who they have to go up up against every night. Like you're playing Monza one night, Lube the other night, Perugia. Um, yeah, even even like uh, the like what we said before, even the teams at the bottom of the standings, like you're still playing tough teams when you're playing uh, Ravenna, like Ravenna. FIBA Valencia. It's not at the bottom, but they've been playing really well this year. So I think yeah, we can underrate maybe some of the mid the mid tier Italian teams quite a bit, just because the top it's so hard to break into the top of, of this league. Yeah, I, I I mean I do agree. I also think that there's something to be said about these one game scenarios because because there in when you're playing in league play there's so much parity and there's you know so much video going around you're focusing way much you're focusing way more on that team and how to break them down whereas if you're showing up for these one game matches you're you know you're not game planning for all three of them intensely and it's going to be much more of a let's just go out there and ball and i think one thing that modena does very very well is that they don't make errors and they're able to keep their ball control in check you know, they, they, they can put pressure on, put pressure on, and, and force other teams to make errors. So, And that's, I think, I think both with Warsaw and with, with Kuzbas is you got two teams that are very pretty offensively minded, and they're going to tend to make quite a few more errors. Yeah, well, like we said, the, the Warsaw issue, I think the, I actually predicted Warsaw to win this pool. 
Um, just because I think they've kind of figured out their opposite situation, was, which was, other than injuries, was their big question mark uh, this season with Mihal Superlak kind of, you know, firmly established in the starting role there. Uh, Jakub Zabrowski leaving the team. Um, so I, I think for Sava, I mean, I know, I know you said that their talent has gotten worse this year, but remember they also added um, Arthur Schalpuk this year to pair next to Bartosz Folek. They lost Broussard, but Angel Trinidad is, is I, I think he's a really good setter as well. I would put him, you know, a few spots behind Broussard, but not, not, a, not a ton. I would agree, but I do think that. And they, and they have maybe like one of the best middle blocking pairs with uh, uh, Andres Rona and Piotr Novakovsky there. I I do agree. I do like the the pairing of Kolek and and Schalpuk. I don't think it's as potent as the um, Semenyuk and uh, Slika uh, pairing that that you no, have at no, at Zaxa. It's not. it's not. It's not. And the biggest thing for me with Angel de, 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 de Trinidad is that he lacks confidence in big situations. And I've I've watched Warsaw kind of blow away a few leads in in sets, and it just seems like all of a sudden he just gets a little bit less sure of himself and a little bit less definitive on where he's giving that ball, and you know starts spraying it around a little bit more. And you know, looking at him, he's uh, comes from Spain, so he hasn't really had as much international experience in those big moments like or like 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 those bigger names. He, to me, he's just not as battle tested, and I think that is reflected in the way that he he runs the team and you know he he's a leader for them on the court well i remember he certainly was battle tested playing poland in the quarterfinals of euro volley 2019 and i think one of the biggest blows i've seen that was not a, that was not a pretty match um but we'll see i i, I pick for Salva. who would you pick to win this pool is it Modena? It, sound, it sounded like Modena from what you were saying. You know what? I'm I'm gonna go with Modena. I'm gonna make Tommy happy. Um, and I'm gonna go with Modena because I think that you know they 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 only need if they can beat Rosalaire, which they're probably going to. Then that that's gonna give them give them four wins, and at that point, the most Kuzbas can do is tie them, right? So, it's. I, I think Modena is going to win this pool, but I do think Kuzbas is going to sneak in Busto, Busto style uh, by going potentially 3-0. and Okay, so Versava is the odd man out then. Yes. Fair enough. Yeah. We'll see. This is, this is I agree with you, though. This is the most interesting pool. Yeah. It's just, you know, there's there's the most intrigue, I guess, I guess you can say. Too bad Rosalaire isn't in there, but that's probably because they... Um, you know, went away from Brett Walsh and decided to go for someone else. So that's what that's what happens. Um. <laughs> exactly, I totally agree with that. As as much as my coworker who is in love with Rusalari disagrees with me. Yeah, who I don't even know who who they picked up to to be to be perfectly honest. Um, all right, now uh, they got our our boy Stein Dulst, the balls, the balls. Uh, nice. yeah, he was at Perugia before or Lube. 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 He was he was the backup to uh, to Bruno and Lube. All right, now moving on yeah. to the final pool. We've got pool E. Uh it was the most interesting pool kind of heading into the first round. I still think that there's a lot of potential for for intrigue here in pool E with Trentino, Friedrichshafen and um Novosibirsk because Trentino has taken a bit of hit. You know, they just got 3-0'd by Milan this this past weekend. It's gonna be. Or was it this past weekend or was it yesterday or Wednesday? No, it was. It was earlier this week. Uh, Wednesday. Yeah, it, it was. Wednesday. It was just. It was just a couple days ago. So they're a little bit uncertain as after being the hottest team in, in volleyball for a little while. I think Friedrichshafen has been amazingly having uh, a very very stellar season, and Novosibirsk. I mean, I feel like they have the possibility of of pulling off an upset. Well, they'll have uh, Constantine Abave back, who's their starting setter. Uh, I was really not a fan of, of Vorpev, who was the guy setting for them in that first tournament. So I think the upgrade at setter will certainly help them quite a bit, as well as getting their starting middles back. So yeah, missing your starting middles and starting setter is, I think, is one of, is the major reason why they didn't uh, seem quite as competitive in that first tournament. Friedrichshof, and like you said have been you know, lighting up the uh, German league, even without a home arena. 
that's the that's crazy. that's the craziest story like when i heard that on the out of system podcast when joe was telling you, he's like yeah you know like in the u.s if you decide a building's dead it's just like okay yeah we'll demolish it in a few years and he was like no they just, yeah. it was just gone within a week and then they haven't they haven't been able to to, to train and it wasn't anywhere. even that old right it was only like 15 15 years old yeah so, something like that but uh but yeah friedrichshafen it just shows how good of an organization friedrichshafen is and it really is a testament like obviously we've seen them have success a huge amount of success in the bundesliga and continual success they're one of those standard teams that we have in the in the the champions league but going through these types of like trials and tribulations and still finding success throw that really shows the quality of your organization yeah and for me future chaffin's always the money ball team i feel like they always find like the 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 value picks the value guys because i i guarantee if you sent some of these guys to other teams like marty jukami like this the estonian outside hitter hasn't like hasn't had a lit it up in his pro career had a few nice moments with the estonian national team in european competition but now he's like this awesome outside hitter for friedrich Schaffen. if you go to uh, nehemia mote who just was in that a video we were discussing before the podcast you know sometimes didn't have the best opportunity kind of bounced around a little bit but now you see he's you know he looks awesome um back back on friedrich Schaffen. so yeah I, I love I love the Moneyball style of play, getting value of guys who are overlooked for Friedrichshafen. I think what Friedrichshafen does well, better than any any other club, is that they develop players. And that's what I've always noticed about Friedrichshafen is that there's so many volleyball teams, it's just a continuous like revolving door of guys. And I mean, I know so many of the Canadian guys that just every year have had a different contract. And it's so rare to find, you know, in in North American sports, a one-year contract is rare, whereas in European volleyball, it seems like a one, 95% of the contracts I hear about are all one-year contracts. And I've always found that Friedrichshafen has a, such a good level of consistency with the athletes that they bring in that allows them to really, you know, thrive as a team as opposed to as as opposed to a group of individuals. Well, I hate to burst your bubble on that one. Oh, are you, are you, generally, I do. Are you going? Generally, I do agree. I do agree <laughs> with you. But do you want to guess how many players they they have from their 2018 2019 team still on the roster? Oh, probably none now. One. One. Dang. Mark, <laughs> Marcus Stewart, the libero. Okay. Well, there um, goes there goes that that <laughs> that theory. No, but I I think I know what you mean. I I would say I I wouldn't maybe agree with the consistency thing, but they do, I feel like they take young players and turn them into great players. I do agree mm -hmm. that they have like this awesome, awesome development program. Cause if I was a young player, Friedrich Schaffen is the place I want to be. Cause I know I'll get playing time. Uh, if like a fair amount of playing time, if I, if I play well, and I'm going to have great coaching as well. Yeah, absolutely. I do think though that they, they need to hire a few more Canadians. That's one of the, one of the few teams in Germany that, yeah. Very rarely. I, I honestly I can't remember a Canadian that's 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 played for them recently. But I think in general they don't really work with, with North Americans a lot. But Yeah, yeah, I guess just Warsley the last couple of years, but yeah, I don't really remember many Americans yeah. uh, playing for them recently either. Yeah. But Friedrich Schaffen, uh, as we mentioned, I think Novosibirsk can like slide in and maybe like sweep the pool. If, yeah, they're going to be better. They're going to be better than they were in, in the first tournament. And so that, this this is this is going to be a messy pool. Other yeah. than Trentino, which, I mean, you were talking earlier about how they lost two <laughs> matches in a row in Italy. Crazy, but I do think that Trentino. I don't think it's a big deal. No, I, think, I, I, I don't Trentino think so at all. Still fine. Yeah, I I think now it's they're kind of in the spot in the same spot where Lube and Perugia were at, where they've established themselves as a top team, and you're going to lull out a little bit, and because you are that top team, you know, teams are going to bring another, another level of effort against you because they want to beat you. And, yeah. and right now, I mean, Trentino was, was, was the cream of the, of the crop. It's, you know, even, even out uh, a little bit, but it'll be, it'll be the first time we get to see Gianelli in the champions league this year. Um, yeah, because, well, I guess yeah. we saw him in the qualifying. Oh, you mean because he was injured? Oh, yeah, because he was injured in the first, right? Or coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. yeah we had Namir Abdelaziz. That seems like so long ago already. But yeah, that was <laughs> it, that was a fantastic story. It seemed like it was last year, and it was just like a couple of months ago. Not even that. Like, yeah, exactly. All right, so Everett, do you want to give 
give the fans your eight picks for who's going to be the quarter finalists after after uh, next week's games. Okay, let's let's. I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, Zaxa obviously is going to be one of them. I'm going to start with the pool winners. I'm going to go Zaxa. Zaxa Lube. I think Lube is going to win the pool. Um, Controversial pick. They've got less sets lost right now, but I mean, that's that's the only thing I'm going off of. Uh, Zaxa Lube, Zenit Kazan, um, Modena. I still think Modena is going to win, and Trentino. Uh, and then the three are going to be. Perugia, some math here. Okay. Per- Perugia and Berlin, and then it's tough. Okay. It's tough with that third place team. It's gonna the the last spot always comes down to like the last match. Like it always comes down to to point. Usually ranking points, sometimes even set ratio. It, it's it's gonna be a very narrow margin for sure for that last spot. Oops. Uh, you know what? I th- I'm going to go with Friedrichshafen. Okay. Yeah. So two I'm, teams qualifying from Pooley. Yeah, that's, 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 oh. Everett's yeah. regretting. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what, that's what I'm going to stick with. I'm, I'm going to stick with, with, with Friedrichshafen. But, uh, yeah. So two German teams. Yeah, I think wow. so. But, I mean, like, let's be honest. Berlin wouldn't be there if it wasn't for... You know? Yeah, that's true. So that's it's true. It, it, it's a top up, a toss up. Although I do feel like if it's if I'm wrong, it's going to be a Russian team making it. It's either going to be Novosibirsk or it's going to be Kuzbass. It's going to be one of the, one of those two those two teams joining into that top eight. Why? Who who do you have in your top eight? I have Lube, Perugia, Zaxa, Skra, Kazan, Berlin, Trentino, and Versava. Okay. So I think the the only ones that have difference, I have Versava, as I mentioned earlier, I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm predicting them to go above Modena. And Skra. And then I also have Skra qualifying above Friedrichshafen, and just because I think four and two with the thirteen ranking points, usually, usually thirteen is good enough to get through with four wins, at least based on what we've seen in this format with the eight teams the last couple of years. Usually, kind of usually thirteen, like twelve, thirteen is, is what you need. Okay. All right. I was picking Friedrichshafen because they went they went two and one. So so far they've only got one loss uh, on on the docket. If they can manage to do that again, both of their only loss, like both of their wins so far, were three ones and, and three zeros. So they've yet to go to five sets uh, in, in a win, and I think that's kind of what helps them the most. Yeah, but they would have to beat Navasabrisk three one or three zero, which I don't know if I'm fully confident in that. And they would have to take a set go take trentino to five or beat them in five because two three one victories would only take them to 12 okay i think you're i guess you're right all right well i i, I <laughs> guess I, I guess we'll it see happen. i like i like i like i like your shopping i guess we'll see too bad we i wish we had like someone doing um graphics behind us so that we could put up a put up a page yeah. um but yeah, I think I'm excited for three straight days. It's a lot. Like trying to watch all the the women's matches this this week were were a lot. Um, I don't think I don't think you can watch them all. No. I think you need to do some court surfing on Eurovolley TV. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a little bit too much. But we'll if you haven't subscribed to Eurovolley TV yet and you want to watch all these matches, that's the best way to do it. Although there is there will be six of the 24 matches that will be streamed live on YouTube. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and by the way, YouTube. Just hit a hundred thousand subscribers, so thank oh, you. Yeah. There, there you go. For, uh, there you go. Matches. CEV, one of the few volleyball um, organizations that uses their YouTube properly. We 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 won't, we won't go into we won't go into that, <laughs> and unless you want to talk about the the new three hundred million dollar holding company that is now working with the the, the FIVB, but that's another story altogether. I think. And by the way, just bought also bought the uh, San Antonio Spurs. I think. Random. Okay. I guess I guess we'll see, but uh, but yeah, I think what was the, the second thing we want to discuss? We want to discuss the Superlega in Italy. Yes, because we're going up on the last week of games. Crazy, it doesn't seem like it's, it. Seems like almost the season flew by, dude. It it it, it really does. Like the fact the fa- I think we need to like applaud 
all of the volleyball leagues for the fact that we've gotten this far. You know, the fact that we've been able to play, that teams have been able to play either 20, 21 or 20 matches in the Super League this year, given everything we've seen, is is a huge testament to how much these leagues have been working. And I mean, and, you know, people at the CEV like yourself. Yeah, that's for sure. It's been a tough year behind the scenes, but, you know, I think once we all kind of figured out that there wouldn't be any fans for the entire season, that did make things a little easier because you don't have that pressure of, okay, are we going to have fans at this match? Are we going to have fans at this match? So, mm-hmm. but yeah, great, great job by all the leagues to, uh, to pretty much get every season done smoothly in every league, which it, it's crazy. <laughs> Massive. Great job. Um, but now we're looking here at the Super League of standings. You can see some, a few teams have a game at hand, have just played 20 matches. Uh, Monza, Milan, Verona, and Ravenna are all at 20 matches. Everyone else is at 21 with, you know, the season uh, being at 22 matches. You're going to see Lube um, and Civitanova both tied at the top of Standings there, Perugia a little bit ahead with the points, 54 compared to 50. Just to just to clarify with everyone, uh, volleyball standings first go wins and then it goes points. Correct? Uh, I know I know the CV does, and I yeah I believe I think the Super League, the Italian League might go points first though. Okay, but. well 54 points right now. Uh, Perugia is in the lead. Uh, they will take home the number one seed. I th- unless unless given maybe they lose they lose this game but if everything goes goes according to plan with Perugia and and Lube Lube will be playing Vibo which is interesting because Vibo is one of Lube's few losses uh, this year they, it was their first loss of the year in the first half of the season. Yeah, exactly. V- I mean, Vibo <laughs> finishing at fourth in the standings is actually is, is ridiculous. It's definitely one of the stories of the season that in in all of volleyball, completely completely unexpected. Yeah, completely like, unexpected. Won no five was. five matches last year. This year they're already at twelve and nine with some massive wins. Um, and and they've they've also they also play a very fun brand of volleyball to watch. It's a lot of yeah, fun be- sure. with between Thibaut Rassard and TJ DeFalco, who's really been coming into his own this year, and then Drame Drame Ab- Ababukar. The, the right side who Abuba. Abuba. Way more fun to say. Yeah. Um they're 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 a lot of fun. And sitting in there right now at fourth, it, we're gonna have to see they're gonna have to do something special against Lube to s- stay in that fourth spot. And, and you were you were talking earlier when you were talking about Friedrichstoff and about continuity in volleyball. And I think Viva Valencia is, is a pretty good example of that, at least the last two years. Because if you look at their their roster, most of it of guys they signed last year, uh, TJ DeFalco, Bartholomew Chin and Yez, um, you know, so, some of these Abuba, like their teams like very similar other than Thibaut Rosario who's coming in and been huge for them. But a lot of the guys are similar. And I think, I think I, I fully agree with you. It's continuity is, is very underrated in volleyball. Like, and I mean, I'm, I'm only speaking in terms of what I've seen here at home, but I was actually thinking about this the other day about how, in general, every every few years I feel like you see like a college super team in the CCAA, where you've got a bunch of guys who played university or and you know played college and they're they've just been around each other and they're a little bit older and they're like, hey, we're gonna go play for this team and we're gonna be really really good and and we're gonna win it all, you know. And there's always a lot of talent. There's usually a couple of guys who have played some youth sports previously, and then they get to the provincial championships, they get to the nationals, and they and they end up losing two teams that were arguably not as skilled but have a better system surrounded surrounded by them. And I think, you know, over over the years, like that Zenit Kazan team, for example, that dominated for so many years, but how much consistency did we see with that squad in terms of those three players that they that they centered it around, right? And maybe, you know, it would be nice to see some of these teams signing longer term contracts with, with, with some of these athletes, I think. I think some of the. I think we'll get there. I feel like we are seeing more two, three year contracts in volleyball. In my, I I think so, but it's gonna be it's gonna be a process, and it's tough. It's when you have so many leagues, so many options for Mm -hmm. the players, so many options uh, for the agents, so many options for the teams. So, yeah, it's it's always also like you know speaking to the Italians in our Discord chat talking about the realities of sponsorship in European volleyball and the fact that, you know, like Modena is still talking right now about having to secure sponsors for next year. My assumption is that maybe in some other higher profile sports, the sponsorship isn't as fickle, let's say, 
where yeah, maybe good... maybe you know maybe the reason they're signing athletes to one year contracts is because they're only signing one year contracts with the sponsors. Yeah, no, for sure. That's a good. That's yeah. You, you have your operational costs. You have your operational income, and you cannot guarantee anything past one year for a lot of clubs. Yeah, that's that's a reality of it. So so looking at this this um these standings, it looks like the the bottom four teams are not making it in here in in the Superliga. You've got Verona sitting in ninth place with only seven wins and twenty two points. They're not going to be able to catch Milan. So we've got the, the the top eight teams set up now for the playoffs. That's the way it works in, in Italy, top eight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, But we can potentially see some movement in those bottom teams. I mean, Milan could win. They could, the, the highest they can get is up to seventh, which, I mean... Those those three bottom teams, you know, seventh, eight, seven, and six. Like you're you're in a tough spot having to play Lube, Perugia, and Trentino in the first round. Yeah, exactly. I mean, those those top three spots for sure to be avoided. And now we see like, yeah, it, it's it's going to be tough. Those teams, I feel, yeah, like you said, are just a, a level above everyone else. It's it's going to be a. Uh, I don't know. I I don't. I think the middle of the Super League has gotten better. I think I think I trust the middle. I mean, I feel like there's Monza, Piacenza, uh, Milano, I guess Modena this year are all like pretty and Vivo Valencia, like mm -hmm. five solid teams in the middle of the Super League. I feel like usually the last couple of playoff teams have been pretty weak comparatively for the Super League. So I feel like if there's any year where maybe something weird happens, it actually it actually probably could be this year. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. I mean, we've seen Milan uh, pick up. Not that I would bet on it, but no, I, I wouldn't bet bet on it either. But I, I mean, we've seen Milan pick up, just pick up a big three nothing win over Trentino. Perugia um, lost to Monza. Uh, Lube lost to to Vibo. You know, they're losing to other teams other than than the other big ones. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, playoffs playoffs should be very exciting, and I don't know. I'm I'm excited. I can feel the energy. We're gonna like. The regular season has been great, and I'm grateful that we're able to have it. But there's just there's something a little different that because we missed the playoffs last year. We haven't had playoffs volleyball since 2019. You know what I'm? There's this is like a double edged sword, but it's kind of exciting to me that I, I I'm this is a silver lining. I'm going to say this is kind of exciting to me that there's no U Sport and CCAA volleyball going on, so that I can focus on this stuff. So I can focus on on Italian league and I can focus on champions league and, and stuff like that because obviously in the past that stuff takes precedent and champions league, Italian league all, all takes the, all takes the back seat. So, you know, if there's any silver lining in what in the no volleyball situation that we have in Canada right now, it is the fact that, you know, for me anyways, personally, I'm going to be able to sit my butt, you know, here in my living room and watch volleyball for the next couple of months and good playoff volleyball. And I'm pretty stoked about that. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's gonna it's obviously very busy time because working in volleyball, doing volleyball playoffs, and also watching a lot of volleyball. But wouldn't have it any other way for sure. Yeah. So Everett, do you want to talk about the best players of the season? Yes, absolutely. Um, mostly Dan has. I've I've done a little bit, but mostly Dan has. Uh, basically, you I, you have your is it like your like first team, second team All Stars? Is that basically like what you've created? Yeah, so I have right. first team, standard volleyball team, seven positions. And because I, you know, it wasn't, that was too easy for me. So, so I, I want to go with a second team as well. So do you want to just go uh, position by position here? Yeah, let's let's start off posi just position by position, just, just so you know. Um, I've got the stats, like the, the stats leaders oh, kind of behind us right now. So you could, if you're talking about someone, I'll be able to pull up kind of where they are and 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 stuff like that but um first of all let's let's start with setter who's your starting setter on the first uh, team this year so, so actually this is probably what this one of the positions where i have two guys head and shoulders above everyone else okay and i was kind of debating between who i want to put in the top position and i ended up going with luciano de Checo on the lube chief de nova and my reason is that everyone on lube has seen big improvements in efficiency and i think a lot of that is due to the way dechaco fits so well with his team plays at a really nice tempo probably makes 
some diff more difficult sets than Bruno was able to do. And I think he just fits so well with Camille uh, wright Slicky and also with Yoandi Liel, especially those two guys. And of course, we all know the legendary the Checo to Simone combo. That has been like the most fun thing to watch in volleyball this year. And I, I do think that we talked a little, little bit about this um, on on the show or on our Discord a little bit. And I think that that, that pairing that, you know, Simone is, is very much a I'm going to kind of just approach. I, I don't think he's that much of a system middle. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that he's a Graham Viagras terms of middle, where is that like, I'm going to be running, I have like these four different types of runs that I'm going to be running. I'm going to be running at different tempos. I'm going to be, you know, I think he's just like, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to create myself a big target for you and you're going to get the ball to me. And yeah, I think... And is like the perfect guy for that. Exactly, because Dejeko just, he kind of runs things at a slower pace. He doesn't move all that fast. Like, he's not a, a hustle worker. But the, his rhythm of the game is maybe unparalleled. You know, his ability to find people and get that ball in that hittable window for them is second to none, right? It may be even better than, better than Bruno. And whereas I think that Bruno, like that Bruno-Lucas connection is so good because they understand that system so innately between the two of them. Whereas the decheco robert landy Simon connection is so good just because of how good of athletes both of them are and that their, their athleticism really combines with each other. Um, but I, I'd actually, I, I'm going to let you finish, but I'm guessing the other guy that you chose him above was Mike Christensen. Yes, okay. for sure. Okay, okay. And I, I still, if I was going to pick one player just for a random team, um, I would probably still pick Micah Christensen as the best setter overall in the world. I think his defense, blocking, serving are probably all better than Dechaco. And his, obviously his ball placement, athleticism, everything is crazy perfect about Micah Christensen. But I don't know. I, I do think Dechaco, just the fact how much he's uplifted his entire team and could Dechaco make Modena into like a top three seed? Probably not, but I don't know. I, I still think the fact that Dechaco has helped turn Lube into this incredible team is, is, is puts him just above Michael Christensen, who's still an extremely talented setter. I mean, that's fair. He's arguably one of the most important, the most important asset on what could be the best team in the world, you know, or in, in Europe, at least when it's, when it's all said and done. So, um, also, I'm a little biased because I feel like Lube is just more fun to watch this year. I don't know. I don't know if that's just me. So much fun to watch, and I truly think that's just that's just the vibe that they've got. You've got all of these other guys who are from you know the west, the west side of the of the world, um, with the the three Cubans and the Argentinian. You know, you've got massive Latin flair right there. I don't think any other team in the world has that. And then right, typically, like you know that. Just by watching him, you know, he's got the hair flowing, just how he interacts with the guys. You know that he's a bro. Like, you know that they have a great time. That's why, like, that's yeah, why I call them sure. the, the Brooklyn Nets. You know, they're the fun time crew. They're just, they're just like, all right, well, we've got the best player in the world over there, and they've got that. So we're just going to amass, it, you know, the Avengers, the Avengers over here, and we're just going to have a lot of fun with it. And, and guess who the most fun team was to watch last year? Perugia. Per yes. He's do you yeah. see a do you see a common common uh, um Decheco. what yeah. yeah um all right moving on from the setter uh let's let, let's just open it up i guess let's go to the middles next who's who's your top two middles sure so i think one guy who we already talked about who recently had probably the hardest hit i've ever watched in a volleyball match disgusting robert landy simon i think is is number one and I think all the top middles are, are pretty close statistically, but I still think he, he's he's one of the leading point scorers there, other than Arthur Schwartz, who I don't know if I count the points he scored at opposite. And, and, oh, and this come on. <laughs> come on. I'm, I'm sorry, Everett. He's not on this list. Uh, spoilers. Um, <laughs> the second the second middle, I, I was going between a few guys here, but I ultimately went with uh, Bartholomew Chin and Yez, the French uh, middle blocker, who's just like, He's a guaranteed bucket. Like he's just like he is, his hitting efficiency is out of control. He's he's so I mean, he, and he's playing with Dave, Davide Seda, who's having a good year, but he's, it's not like he's being fed by Decheco or Christensen, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, and he's still been. I think he's he's always had the athleticism and the power, but now he's really developed his shots, right? Like he's going he's going deep so much. 
he, he still doesn't really have the changeup game, but he's finding angles. He's going deep, and I think I think he's going to start for France at the Olympics. I think that Seda, the way he sets him, is Seda is very much in the setter's pool of Di Cecco, and I'd say Bentonuti is more in the setter's pool of Bruno, whereas Seda is more of a rhythm setter. He's more of a, I'm going to get the ball to you, and whereas I think you know when you're playing for France, they're very there is a lot of skill that's involved in the game, but they're very um, uh, like structure heavy. You know, and that he has to play within that system. Whereas I think that, you know, Saida just kind of puts it up for them. And there's been a few times that I swear to God that Saida's just given him like, I'm not, I'm just going to give you like a one and a half ball and I'm going to let you go up there and just kind of like clink it yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. Like similar to when like a high school team or a club team had that one banger middle and you just set up a meter ball and you just let them go at it. That's kind of been my feeling with Bart. Bar- Bar- I, I can't, I can't pronounce it right now um, for, for Vivo this year. Yeah, and I mean, he's a pretty good blocker too, but I think just like the offensive threat he has is, is really kept the uh, opposing middles at home. And, you know, I definitely try try not to underrate middle blocking because I feel like we always, always get caught up in the, in the point scoring for middle sometimes and it's easy to get to get lost in, in that. Uh, I would I would love to see more comprehensive stats on blocking. Exactly. It's, it's You can always use the eye test. And by my eye test, Simon and Chin and Yes are both very good blockers. But yeah, you're right. Without without having the advanced kind of scouting data, it's 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 ultimately hard to say. Yeah. Um, and then on my uh, Sebastian Soleil. Sorry, uh, I, I only got Soleil there. You you pa- pause there. You. Uh, Podrask- Podraskin in? Serbian. One, one of the Serbians on on uh on Trentino and it was close because I watching the games I feel like Lizanach is better but then every time I look at the stats Pedrashinin is is scoring more efficiently and has more blocks so okay well I I would I I would also grow with 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 Soleil and Pedraskinin as well um Soleil I find Soleil might be one of the most underrated middles in the world and I might be saying this because of how many times I've watched him in Argentina burn Canada um, and just beat us up in the middle. Once again, Mr. Friggin' Jacheco that we, that we talk about. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have no uh, arguments with any of your top four, four middles there. You know that in my heart, I would love to be able to push for uh, Arthur Schwartz. But obviously, since Julio Sabi has jumped in on... Um, on on uh, Cisterna, he hasn't been featured in the offense as as much uh, as as he was before. But I still think he's been having a, a great year, and he's he's he's, he's he's been having a great season. He's sure. still number one in my heart. Really he's still number one in my heart. Okay, that's uh, and that, uh, and that's, what, and that's that. what matters. <laughs> but I think uh, I think it was a good reputation season for him. He's he's gonna he has some more eyes on him for sure yeah. than he had before. I'm very excited to see where both Lepke and. Um, and Arthur Schwartz go next year. I, I really think that they're going to be taking much bigger contracts for bigger bigger uh, teams next year. Well, developing a good reputation in Italy is, first of all, a very hard thing to do, but also can be one of the most lucrative things you can do in volleyball. 100%. Absolutely. All right, moving on. Uh, let's let's hear for your, your right sides. Who are you going on the right? So first, probably don't even need to talk about it. Numeria Abdelaziz, super easy. And just yeah. having an unbelievable season. Uh, and then the second one, there's a few guys you could go with, I think, but I'm going to go with Addis Lagum, Lagumja, is how we're saying it, I think, on Monza. Because first of all, I kind of wanted to have a Monza guy on here because uh, I didn't pick Max Holt. So I, you know, I thought Lagum, Lagumja. And I've been talking about him for a few years. I remember some guy messaged me like three years ago being like, oh, there's this guy on our Turkish youth team that's going to be unreal. Like, go check him out, Lagumja. I'm like, sure. And I was like, Dude, damn, this guy's sick. He was he was one of the top scorers there for a while, and you st- you're seeing him right here. I'm I've got the 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 top um scores on the league. He's seventh right now in Super League of scoring, and he's only played in 17 matches. So he's got four less matches than some of the guys uh, who are ahead of him in in the scoring race. And I think that's massive. I I, I think that's that's huge. The fact that he has four less matches. How many, you know, that's probably like a hundred less sets than some of those other guys. And yeah. he's still in the top ten of scoring. 
yeah, no, he's been really good. It'll be he'll be a staple of whatever top team. We'll see if if that if you know Turkey qualified for Euro Volley, so, which which is great for them. But we'll see if this kind of this kind of there's a few young guys here on Turkey with uh, like Gumja with uh, Effie Bayram as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and apparently Addis Lagumja's little brother Mirza Lagumja is pretty good as well, playing on Izmir this year. Mm-hmm. Um, That's what they just all go through Glenn's Hogue system at. Uh, yeah. And Arcus, and then you know he's basically creating the Turkish system for him. But I definitely agree. I, you know, you could definitely make the the case for both uh, Reichlikli and Abubakar the other guy. and Abuba, but and a little. I don't know. About, uh, I don't think Abuba. I've just seen him melt in too many matches, and he, you know, he's been subbed out a few times just because he's he's not, hasn't been able to score. I don't know. I honestly, I. I think Viva Valencia is probably looking for an upgraded opposite for next year. I would say so. Yeah, I, I would. I would say so too. One guy who I would have thought had would have had a better season was uh, Grozier, and I mean I know that Grozier did suffer an injury, but he's only got he started one. Started off pretty hot. He started off pretty hot, but he only has one less match played uh, than Lagumzia, and has significantly less points. Right? He's only he scored two hundred twenty-one points this season. Oh, I'll scroll down so people can see that. Uh, Grozier scored two hundred twenty-one points in his career currently in 26th, whereas Legumgia, with only one more point, has scored almost 100 more, with only one more match played, has scored almost 100 more points uh, up here at 319. So I would have thought, you know, I've been a huge, huge Gregor Grozier fan for, for a long time, and, you know, we did see him suffer that, that injury, but uh, he may be one of those guys who's kind of a little bit more on the decline. Yeah, I, th- I think Grozier... I'm su- I'm surprised actually. I was impressed how well he was playing earlier because we have seen a pretty steady decline here for Grozier for a few years, and it's tough. He's he's a bit of a heavier guy, so those injuries really start to pile up. But but I have a question, Everett. Um, why have neither of us mentioned Tonchek Stern yet? For um, any, because he for any, for any newer volleyball fans maybe. Because like I mean yeah absolutely, and then, I mean another guy too like. So, so, but he's the fifth leading scorer, but in my opinion, he does not deserve at all to be mentioned among the guys we've mentioned so far. No, he's a fifth leading scorer for a team that's outside of the playoffs, you know? And, and hitting 36% efficiency. Yeah. Which is okay. Which is okay if you're a U sports second year player, but if you're a starting opposite in the Italian Super Liga, it's not, it's horrible. He's only got 86 break points, which comparing it to the guys around him, it's just, it's just, not good enough, you know. I, I think at the end of the day, great. If you if you want to go be an all star on a non playoff team, all the power to you. But you're not going to be making making any of my all star teams. That's that's you're for not sure. Make, you're not making this guy's all star team. Hell no, no. <laughs> do do better. And it's like I do think, and straight up, I think that I think that that might be much more of a product of Kavika Soji than it might be of his his ability. Like I, I think that Shoji is, is definitely, you know, I, I, you know, I like Shoji, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of a fan of his. And I think that he puts his hitters in good situations. He doesn't do anything too flashy. He's not the most best athlete, but he is an exceptional all around volleyball player. Yeah. And I think he's an awesome guy, really, really cool guy. But I, 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 I will say if you look at the teams that he's been on the last few years, look at their records before, during and after he's been on the team, it's not, not the prettiest picture, unfortunately. Fair enough. I'm I'm still I'm still Team Shoji. I'm I'm still I'm, I'm Team Shoji too. I'm Team Shoji. I, I'm, I'm still Team Kavika Shoji. All right, we're gonna now the final position. We're gonna go to the left side. Um, a couple of Cubans, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, so which two Cubans? <laughs> Marlon Yance. Yeah, cool. <laughs> man, he's the he's future. Gonna be good. The, the future in a few years no, when we is. have this conversation, he's, like. He's 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 going to be up there with uh, Leon and Leal in a few years, but yeah, those are the two guys, the double L's, Leon Leal, as my two uh, the two best outside hitters. I think Leal is having like his best season since like prime Santa Cruzero days. Yeah, I think so too, and that's scary. I really think that the way that P- Lube plays and how much they divide that offense, and how many times have we have have I like looked at a Lube score sheet at the end of the game, and you've got five players in the in the double in the double digit range yeah, or you've got yeah, four sure. you've got four players who have like just really 
like held that load for them. And that's why ultimately I think Lube is a better team than, than Perugia. I think Lube could be the number one team in both Champions League and the Super League at the end of the year because of their ability to, you know, spread that offense out and really ride everyone. If someone's not working, if one player isn't working, then someone must be. But I think Leal in these older years has really, really benefited at not being that number one workhorse, at not being that number one guy. And you've got, you know, you, you've got, four other guys on the on the court who's going to be able to take those swings for you yeah exactly and, and i mean leal could be a number one guy but like you said i think i think he does do better as a number two guy and the, but the reason i chose him kind of over his uh over his teammate who is also very close to this level i think he's the best blocking left side hitter in the league this year him and robert landy simon have made are just like terrifying to hit against for a lot of opponents and I'm not I, I'm not sure what the stats are for his blocking, but just just watching watching the tape, he's he's been in so many situations where he's absolutely s- like stolen the soul of outside hitters. And I think we're in opposites too, obviously. But uh, I think that I think that matters a lot for outside hitters. I'm trying to find here Leal on the. So he's currently, and this is why exactly why like I hate blocking stats because they're so shallow. They, they, he, has, he has like he has like point zero eight blocks per per set. Or something. I'm looking total, and he's only got twenty four total blocks this year. You know, yeah. and like actually, it's Anzani who's leading. Anzani has fifty two blocks. Yeah, but I when I watch the game, Simon and, and Liao, that's like the the two guys that are when I have Simon Liao. Uh, right slicky front court that's like ridiculous that 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 is that is pretty ridiculous um all right so that's uh you said leal and and then want to rain on the second team as, as i just said okay pretty obvious just doing his thing barely declining but declining slightly every year but still unreal and then the last outside you could have gone with a bunch of guys uh, but i ended up going with yuki ishikawa on milano I think he's been the most consistent player. I think he's efficient. I think he's one of the best passing outside hitters in the league, which I think was the kind of the tiebreaker for me. Strong server. He's just, he's, he's got everything. He's, he's no weaknesses in Yuki Ishikawa. And I was, the other guy I was thinking, Tebow Rosario, who's been unreal as well. And, you know, you could go with him easily as well. But, but I think, uh, I think I, I ended up going with Yuki. Okay. Maybe, maybe I, I just started watching Q, so maybe I'm, I'm biased. Yeah, maybe. Maybe maybe all of that uh, that uh, free promo that the FIVB loves giving all of the Japanese players is starting to get in your head there. Because really, you're going to pick Yuki Ishikawa over Tsubo Like, the, like okay. this guy, this guy hey, is in fourth go, place go. in scoring. 348 points. And he is the big... like. Tsibo Rasog is what Yuki Ishikawa was supposed to be. Ishikawa was supposed to br- come in and be kind of like a Trevor Clevno back in the day when he paired up with Mara and they took a good run of the, the Super League. That's who Ishikawa was supposed to be. But if if you look on this list too, like averaging like points per set, there is no difference between Ishikawa and Mar. And I'm sorry for me, Ishikawa does not pass the eye test. How many times have I seen Ishikawa get blocked or make an error in system? And this is where like, this is where the frustration between watching Milano for me this year, between how much they favor, like in system, that ball is going to Ishikawa. The majority of time, like the Mar is gonna get that bar, a ball in the pipe in system, or he's going to get junk balls. And even then, Mar still has more break points than Ishikawa, as well as playing less less matches. Right? And you, you see those matches when they had no Petri and no Tini earnout. Like, Mar was the one stepping up. So, I don't know if any of your choices has trig- triggered me as much as Ishikawa just there. But I can't, oh, That's like, good. We got some reaction out of you, Ivor. I, I like it. But, like, Tsibo Rassar... Dude has been balling, and you said it yourself. He's the only biggest change for Vibo this season, and they go from a team who won five games last year to winning twelve, and they might be able to win thirteen. Like he has been absolutely unreal, and he's fourth in scoring, right? Three hundred forty-eight points, averaging four point three pot, uh, four point three five um, points per set. Like dude has been a baller on another level, and you know what? Like other than Leon and Namir, you have. A ser- like for me, he's a serious candidate as MVP.
He's pretty good. Right, because the next the next Vibo player that you can find on the yeah. in the top twenty score or the top scorers is Abu, uh, Abuba at fourteen, and then Defalco comes in at twenty three. So I like Gasol has been doing some crazy things for them, and he is not a, a physical guy. Like he has been having an all time season. It's been a lot of fun to watch him. You say I'd say he's he's a pretty he's a pretty strong guy though. He's he's got a pretty like wicked arm i think that's one of his best 100 percent, but he's not six foot eight yeah that's true that's you know true. like he's a smaller he's a smaller outside um like even like a guy like micheletto uh for for trentino i know i know he's young but like he's he's a taller guy you know and as soon as you're taller you're just gonna have you're gonna have that higher reach you're gonna have angles that are a little bit more avail- available to you I, I i would think honestly i would put for me my top two left sides would be Thibaut Gasol and and leon and then i would have leal and Juan and leon Juan Torreira as as number twos and also i'd throw in an honorable mention as lepke because i love him and then but also oleg plotnitsky i've been sleeping yeah, on plotnitsky yeah, really and plotnitsky is like if Plotnitschke isn't there, Borussia is in serious trouble because he's sure. he's so, he's just been their workhorse all year. So I, I have to give him, you know, uh, my special, you know, he he's an honorable mention. Let's say. And just on Plotnitschke, before I go to some of those other points, the stuff he's added to his game, like I feel like I see him like grow, like the amount I, you can you can tell he's he's a worker because. He's working a ton behind the scenes because he's added this entire new element to his game this year of these roll shots and these deep tips and like really like high skill shots for outside hitters. And, you know, he's always going to have the athleticism. He's always going to have the serve. But yeah, he has the roll shots. He has this like really nasty. uh, He's obviously left handed. So he has this really nasty cross shot to the opposing tee that's like scoring on everyone, especially if there's a single block this year. So, but in Ishikawa's defense, I think. In Ishikawa's defense, I think Rosario, after 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 you, you made your point, I'd probably put him there. But Ishikawa, first of all, the floor defense is unreal for Ishikawa. He's made so many important plays. Also, he's had like a, some really good moments this year. One of them against Monza, where he served those two aces in a five-setter. I think it was tied 18-18. Ishikawa goes back, rips two aces in a row to win the match. Like, I feel like Ishikawa has more, more moments in my mind that I remember. And... Yeah, but I, I think Rose started. It's a good point. He's he's he has had a fantastic season. Did did Ishikawa beat Lube? It's did. <sighs> I don't know, actually. <laughs> Probably not. No, no, they 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 Milan hasn't. Um but you know what I, I have to say, you know, like I I do see the hype around Ishikawa, but personally I'm just gonna go out there and say it. Ishikawa does not get this level of hype if he comes from another country. If he doesn't come from Japan, where, you know what, like, Those. you know, like the the yeah, le- yeah. the no, level the agree. level of hype that certain players from certain countries get, and because you know the FIVB wants to cater to their fan base, and I mean it makes sense, but you know, Ishikawa, how many different things have we seen over on Ishikawa over you know over the years, and or uh, you know, and uh, I don't. I feel like Nishida is a lot more overhyped than Ishikawa. Yeah, my, uh, uh, absolutely. I I agree, and I mean it's still... Ishikawa. You can make the case if he's like a top top twenty outside hitter, top fifteen maybe even. Uh, hundred percent. Nishida, I don't know if you can go if you can go that high. No, I don't think so. I don't think he like he's still young and he needs to do something, right? And yeah, he hasn't sure. he hasn't other than having. Like did did he do well in Nations League? I think yeah, he had a pretty decent Nations League and he then was had the a leading pre- score. I'm pretty sure, or just about. Honestly, straight up, I'm gonna. This will be a discussion for another uh-huh. time. But if I were to one, if if I were to take control of the FIVB, one of the first things I'd do is abolish the Nations League. Get rid of it completely. Okay, we, well, we that, that is a big. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> that is a big one. We're the only. We're the only. We're the only sport that has an uh, uh, an international league that goes every year like that. But I digress. Well, there might be three hundred million dollars of disagreement there. <laughs> well, how come? How come no other sports like basketball or soccer or hockey uh, have leagues like that, and yet would all sign billion dollar contracts? That is a, that is a very good topic that deserves its own podcast. Let's, is what I will. Let's <laughs> I will let's let's do it sometime. Um, but yeah, I think 
just to kind of, I know I kind of like chimed in with, with, with my guys there. Um, I mean, I think that the only, there's only a few disagreements we have. I would flip flop Christensen and DeCecco mainly because I think that Christensen has meant so much more to his team this year than DeCecco has. But, you know, like if you take Mo Christensen away from Modena, Modena's like they're down there with Cisterna at the, yeah. at the, at the bottom. Whereas like if you take away DeCecco and put in even like a Dav David Saida or, you know, someone else, like they're still going to be a top three team. Um, okay. In terms of the middles, can't really disagree. Uh, oh, we never went over the libs. Yeah. So I have Grubenikov as my top one. Yeah. Sure. Um, and I don't obvious. know. The second one's weird. There's a there's a few good guys, but I I ended up going with Slovenia and uh, Yanni Kovacic, even though he's on not a good team. His percentages are unreal, and he's just you know he was best of the libero. I, I watched him a lot at Euro Volley 2019, so I think he, I think he's one of the more underrated liberos because I feel like he's he's pretty top guy, but no one ever really talks about him. And then all, but now uh, Santiago Dani, a similar situation. You can go either of those guys, but I ended up going with Kovacic. You know, he is second in pass or er, media median passing, I guess, with a six and, with like a, a score of six point zero eight nine, which no one knows what that means. That it, and also the passing statistics are almost as bad as the blocking. Uh, they're block, worse. The blocking statistics. They're, they're worse. You know, at least at the end of the day, you can be like, oh, I got three blocks this match. It doesn't like it. There's there's it's like, oh, I passed the ball perfectly. But like, what's perfect? Like, there's no. There's, there's no scale. I think we should move it to a three scale. But that, once again, that's another that's another podcast for another time. That's that's what we're doing today. Is we're just we're just like making mental notes for podcasts <laughs> podcasts yeah. in the Scheduling future. Scheduling them in the future. Yeah. Well, Ro Rob and I have. I don't know if you saw it on our Discord chat. By the way, everyone, you've heard us mention the Discord chat uh, a few times. Just come in, hang out. There's there's links on, on the website. Um, I'm a big part of it. Dan is a, is a huge part of it. We've got people from across Canada and around the world who literally are, you know, typing in the chat every single day. We've got a lot of fun conversations and it's just a good time. So if, you, if you're a volleyball nerd like us, come, come join us, come join us on the dark side. M must have for volleyball nerds for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think is, is there anything that you would like to, to, to add at the end here to, to, to wrap it all up? Um, not really. I mean, I wish they did like a real all-star team. Like a, it's probably one of my favorite things that's missing from European sports. Absolutely. Like an all, like a, I, I know or that all the league team, something like that. I've seen in the past, like Poland has had an all-star yeah, game Poland, in the past. Yeah. And they, usually it's like for like domestic against foreigners. Uh, and I know Korea has had, ha, has an, an MVP or an all-star game as well too, because I remember watching some hilarious highlights of, uh, Dallas Sunius when he was playing there doing some crazy stuff during the uh, during the all-star game that an all-star game would be would be a lot of fun that's my main takeaway from from this conversation I want to I want to bounce off yes like for sure and and if you if you just had a guy with a imagine the TikTok content imagine like the videos you could do millions millions of views easy millions millions see that's what we need to invest the 300 million into not you know not the fiv <laughs> piss it away but whew. yeah anyways <laughs> i had someone reach out to me asking me about what they thought and they had pr they've previously worked for the fivb and uh they're like what do you think of this and i had to specify and i was like well are you asking as a friend or as someone from the fivb and he was like as a friend and i was just like i mean uh. We've we've seen we've seen what happens with you know we saw what happened with the major series they were they were supposed to be something big and and shiny that we were supposed to get and five years later they are probably dead, um, but that being said Dan really appreciate you coming on board today talk chat about some Champions League um, chat chat about some Italian league playoffs the final matches will be going down there's three matches tomorrow I believe in in the Superliga and then there's a few four on Sunday. No. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't checked. I know there's I know there's three three matches tomorrow. We'll pull it up right here on the website. Um yeah, Lube versus uh Vibo, uh, Mod Modena versus Cisterna, Perugia versus Monza. So both Lube and 
um, Perugia are playing revenge matches this week because they both lost uh, that 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 match in in the first half of the season. Um, and then on Sunday you've got oh, and then also tomorrow there's four matches tomorrow. It's a Super Saturday yeah, in the in the Super League. Saturday is the main the main match day. It looks like. Yeah. So and then you've also got Trentino uh, against Ravenna, and then on Sunday will be the last one to wrap it all up with Padova and um, Verona. What, what a match to end the season that will be. That will be a banger. Two teams not in the playoffs, yeah. <laughs> going going toe to toe. Is there any rele- relegation? Do we know? Uh, I don't think there is this year. No. All right. Yeah, because Sora is already out, so they would be the ones relegated. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, guys, thank you very much for tuning in today. Uh, if you haven't already and you don't, please go check out Dan uh, at 51VB on Instagram, on YouTube. He makes some really, really great content. And also come join our Discord channel. If you've got any questions, we'd be happy to field them there. And maybe, you know, we've seen a few times this week where podcast esque questions have come up in the chats. And uh, I think I think we're gonna we're gonna start fielding some more. So, Dan, appreciate you, you taking the time. There's lots to talk about. Yeah, thanks thanks Everett. And Always a pleasure chatting chatting volleyball. And uh, yeah, guys, we will see you uh, next time. When that next time is, I don't really know, but yeah, we'll see you. Thanks a lot, and uh, have a good one. Peace.